You've heard this statement that the wheels of justice grind slowly but exceedingly fine. God, as one of his characteristics, is very long suffering. God is very patient with evil. This patience and long-suffering of God is one of those notable characteristics. James, when he was writing his epistle, exhorted us towards patience as we wait for the coming of the Lord. For he said, the Lord is waiting for the complete fruit of harvest and has long patience for it. But there is always that danger if, of mistaking the long-suffering and the patience of God for blindness on the part of God. And that was the case with Judah. They had turned their backs upon God. The nation had become progressively more wicked. And they began to say that the Lord doesn't see. The Lord is blind to what is going on. And they actually thought that they were getting by with their evil. That it didn't really matter to God. The things that they were doing. That God was tolerating and had come to the place of tolerating evil. The wheels of justice grind Slowly. And yet they grind. The judgments of God that often are long in coming ultimately do come. During the time of Noah, when the wickedness in the earth was exceedingly great, and God saw that the imagination of man's heart was nothing but evil continually. God spoke to that righteous man, Noah, who Peter said was a preacher of righteousness. And God commanded him to build an ark that he might escape the coming judgment that was to come upon the earth because of the wickedness. And we are told that he was a hundred years preparing that ark. One hundred years he was a preacher of righteousness. One hundred years he was warning the people of the judgment of God that was going to come against that sinful generation. But because the judgment of God was so long in coming, they had deceived themselves into believing that it wasn't going to come. They made fun of Noah because he warned of the impending judgment of God. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was laughed at. But one day Noah and his family went into the ark with the animals that God had drawn to that ark of safety. And it said, and God closed the door and the judgment of God began to fall upon the earth in the days of Noah, though it was a long time coming it did come, and the earth that was before the flood perished. 
The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were filled with evil. And it would seem that God had just allowed them to get by with their evil. And thinking that they were getting by with their evil, they became increasingly worse. Until the homosexuals were actually prating in the streets. And they became so aggressive, they began to rape other men. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in his judgment as he sent the fire from heaven that destroyed those cities of the plain. Here the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, it had become exceedingly evil. They had turned their backs upon God. And God had been sending his prophets for over a hundred years to warn them that he would not tolerate their evil. And finally the day came when God ordered the six angels to stand there with their slaughtering weapons and to wait for that seventh angel to mark those that would be spared from the judgment. And then they went through and, and utterly, God said, slay the people. Though the wheels of justice grind slowly, they do grind. And judgment is a certainty that can be counted upon. Peter, when he was talking about the last days, said that there would be scoffers who would challenge the judgment of God to come. The coming day of judgment. They said, where is the promise of his coming? And that they would begin to teach uniformitarianism, which is the foundation of the evolutionary theory. That since the beginning, all things continue as they were. It all goes on in the same kind of processes and cycles from the beginning. But Peter said of this fact, they are willfully ignorant. That the judgment of God did come in the days of Noah. And that God did destroy those who had turned their backs on him. And that the world today is being readied for this coming judgment, which will come upon the world as a thief in the night. Lately here in California, the earth has been shaking. And I think that it is just a subtle reminder from God of the big shake that's coming. Not just of California, but of the whole world. For God said that he was going to shake the whole world until everything that can be shaken will be shaken and only that which cannot be shaken will remain. What you've seen in the last month or so is child's play compared to what's coming, God's judgment upon the earth. But it is interesting, we note in our text that God is always discriminant in his judgment. Here we see in our text that there was this angel in, clothed in linen and he had this inkhorn. And he was told to go through the city and to mark those that sighed over the evil. Those who were weeping over the abominations. For they are to be spared by God when the slaughter begins. Again in history we see examples how God is always discriminatory in his judgment. 
when God was going to destroy the earth by the flood, the Bible speaks of that righteous man Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and how God made provisions to spare Noah from the destruction by which the world would be wiped out. When the angels of the Lord were on their way to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they met Abraham and they informed Abraham of their intention, how that the wickedness of this city had ascended to God and they were being sent by God to destroy the wicked. And Abraham argued with the Lord. He said, shouldn't the Lord of the earth be fair? Shouldn't he be just? Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous men in that city? And the Lord said, I will spare it for the 50 righteous sake. What if there be 10? I will spare it for 10. When they came to the city and saw firsthand the wickedness that was there, they said to Lot, get out of here, get your family out of here, warn them, we're going to destroy this place. And in the morning as they were hastening Lot out of the city, they said, hurry and get out of here, we can't destroy it until you're safely out. God delivered that righteous man, Lot. But the cities were utterly destroyed. God is discriminatory in judgment. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and were being subjected to that horrible bondage and slavery, persecution, God brought the plagues upon the Egyptians. And we read where God was discriminatory even in the plagues. How there was darkness over the land of Egypt, but there was light in the camp of Israel. And how in that final plague, when the Lord was to slay the firstborn of every family in the land, how that the Lord made provisions to discriminate for the Israelites, by, he, by his declaring to them that they were to take a lamb of the first year out of their flock, they were to kill it, put the blood in the basin, and with hyssop, sprinkle the blood upon the lintels and on the doorposts. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. And thus, as the death struck the homes of those in Egypt, God was discriminatory in his judgment and he spared those houses that had the seal of the blood over the lintels and doorposts of the house. There you have much like the case when God finally destroyed Jerusalem. This angel went through with the inkhorn and marked those who were sighing and against the abominations and were crying out to God for the wickedness that filled the land. And they were spared. Ezekiel said he saw the slaughter going on and then he said, and I was left. I was one of those that was spared this judgment of God. In verse 9, we read of the reason why God brought his judgment against Jerusalem. He said, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. The land is full of blood and the city is full of perverseness. The land was full of blood. Innocent blood. There was a time of 
moral laxity. People had begun to worship Ashtoreth and Molech, the goddess of sexual pleasures. And with this heightened interest in sex, this heightened stimulus, there were a lot of unwanted babies being born. And they would build the bonfires to this god Molech and they would throw the babies into the fire. Innocent blood being shed. According to Josephus, there were roving gangs in the streets killing innocent people, a time of real anarchy. And the people had taken the attitude that God had forsaken the earth. He didn't see what was going on. It didn't really matter to God how they lived. This attitude that God doesn't see, that God doesn't care, that God has forsaken the earth, it doesn't really matter to God, seems to be the attitude that we've taken here in America today concerning the abortion issue, where over 25 million babies, innocent lives, have been destroyed in the abortion mills. We now have a man even running for president who openly declares his approval of the slaughter of these innocent babies. I myself would never vote for anybody who believed in killing innocent babies. But God doesn't see is the attitude. God doesn't care. And we seem to have that attitude concerning homosexuality. That it really doesn't matter. Sexual preference is something of your own choice. And it doesn't matter to God if you live in sexual perversion. It was for these things that God destroyed Judah, that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And it is for these very same reasons that God's judgment is coming upon our earth today. The Bible speaks a lot about the coming judgment of God. It is commonly known in the scriptures as the period of great tribulation. A time when the wrath of God will be poured out upon our world. But God will be discriminatory in that judgment for he will deliver his people out of the world before that event takes place. We call it the rapture of the church. And then those people of Israel who are sincere in their hearts before God, he will seal them in their foreheads like as the angel went through and sealed here in Jerusalem. And we read in Revelation that he'll seal 144,000 to take them through, to spare them from the judgments that are coming upon the earth. It is interesting to note that in the chapter here, God said, start in the sanctuary of the Lord. The judgment was to begin in the temple. Peter says the time has come when judgment must begin at the house 
of God. And if it begins at us, what will be the end of those that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous are scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In many of the churches today across America, the pulpits are filled with men who deny the Bible as the inerrant, inspired word of God. They deny that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That salvation comes through faith and believing in Jesus Christ as the substitute for us in his atoning death. For they deny the atonement. There are some churches that have gone so far as performing marriage rights for homosexual and lesbian couples. And there are ministers that are ready to be spokesmen for every liberal evil cause. Judgment must begin at the house of the Lord and judgment will come. And the judgment of God is going to come upon this earth, but the question is, where will you be when God begins to pour out his wrath and his fury? Mark those, the Lord said, who sigh. Mark those who cry because of the abominations. Do you find yourself sighing over the iniquity that fills our land? The violence, the murder, the adultery, the abortions, the blasphemous language? Or do you watch it on television and get some kind of a pleasure and excitement out of watching violence and adultery portrayed on television? Have you been crying out because of the abominations that fill our land? Have you been on your face before God weeping because of the iniquity? Or has your pursuit of your own pleasure given you a careless disregard for what's happening? Those who sighed over the conditions those who cried out to God because of their great concern over the abominations were the ones that God had marked out for protection. When Jesus was talking about this judgment that is coming, he began to describe the things that would take place. The earthquakes, the pestilences, such as AIDS. And have you heard the latest news? A new strain of AIDS that doesn't, a new strain of the HIV that doesn't show up positive in the testing. That's frightening. How are we going to protect the blood supply if, if it doesn't show up? Three homosexuals a day are dying of AIDS in San Francisco at the present time. Jesus said these would be the signs of the end. These earthquakes in diverse places. These pestilences that would sweep the world. But he said to his church, pray always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things that are going to come to pass upon the earth. And then he warned, lest at any time you should be so interested in just eating and drinking and you'd be burdened down with just making a living, the cares of this life. That that day would catch you by surprise. 
For as a snare, he said, it shall come upon all who dwell upon the face of the earth. The wheels of justice grind slowly, but exceedingly fine. We're just about to the end of the line. The patience of God will soon change as it does and has in history. The cup of iniquity is beginning to overflow. And the earth is on the verge of seeing the judgment of God poured out. As God will again reveal the fact that he does see and he hasn't forsaken his plan. Where will you be? Will you be one of those who will be spared the judgment because of your sighing over the wickedness, your crying over the abominations? Where is your heart today? What is your attitude towards the evil today? Is it an attitude of toleration? Is there some kind of a subtle enjoyment of watching it portrayed in the movies? Or are you repulsed and repelled by the evil? And do you sigh in your heart over what's happening in our world? Do you cry out to God? because of the abominations. They're the ones that God will protect. They're the ones that will survive the judgment to come. Shall we pray? Father, sober, serious business. As we see our world rapidly deteriorating, and moving toward that day of judgment. Lord, we marvel that you have been so patient. We marvel that you've allowed things to go as far as you have. That you have not yet intervened. Lord, we realize that you're setting out the warning signs as we see, Lord, the earthquakes and as we see the pestilences, we realize that these are just warning signs to your people. Get ready. The day is at hand. Help us, Father, as your people that we might really sigh over the iniquity in the world. We will not buy into that world system of tolerance of evil. God, may we cry out against the abominations. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Ezekiel and Jeremiah were not popular prophets. The people didn't really want to hear the message that they had. There were other prophets in their day that were very popular. They were telling the people, oh, it's peace and safety. We're on the verge of a new era of prosperity and glory, and, and people liked to hear that. They didn't want to hear the truth that God, though patient, was going to judge. Today, 
It's not a popular message. It's not one that I really delight in preaching. But if I did not, I would not be a true prophet of God and I would be derelict in the calling of God upon my life to warn the people. As God said to Ezekiel, and if I say to the wicked, you're going to die in your wickedness. If you don't warn them, they will die in their wickedness, but their blood I'll require at your hand. Paul the apostle, when he was talking to the elders of Ephesus, he said, I am innocent of the blood of all men because I have not come short of declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I've declared to you all of what God has said. God's day of judgment is coming. I believe it's coming very, very soon. And God will discriminate when that day comes. If you're a child of God, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're not a child of God, if you've been caught up in the evil of this world, if you've been lulled into that attitude, well, God is asleep or God doesn't see or God is forsaken, then you'll find yourself being judged with the world. It's going to be a fearsome, awesome thing. But you can escape it through Jesus Christ. I would encourage you this morning, if God has been speaking to your heart about your relationship with him, to go back to the prayer room and there make things right with God. May the Lord be with you and watch over you and guide you by his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord.